Ladies and gentlemen, um, my name is uh, Ian White and I'm Vice Chancellor of the University of Bath and I'd like to thank you very much for joining us online. I'm delighted to welcome you to this special lecture hosted by the University of Bath Institute for Policy Research and I'm honoured to welcome Lord Sedwell as our guest speaker this evening. Thank you so much. Mark is a British diplomat, public policy analyst and senior civil servant. He was cabinet secretary from April 2018 to September 2020 and national security advisor from April 2017 to September 2020, serving under Theresa May and Boris Johnson. He's the only person to have held both these high profile roles at the same time. As cabinet secretary, Mark was the government's most senior advisor in strategy policy and implementation. As Secretary to the Cabinet and the National Security Council, he was responsible to the Prime Minister and Cabinet for the proprietary and effectiveness of Cabinet governance. As Head of the UK Civil Service, he's led over 400,000 civil servants in Her Majesty's Government and devolved administrations, over 90% of whom are involved in the delivery of public services to the citizen. Prior to this, he was Permanent Secretary at the Home Office FCO political director, NATO senior civilian representative in Afghanistan and uh, Her Majesty's ambassador to Afghanistan. He joined the FCO in 1989, serving in Egypt, Iraq, Cyprus and Pakistan. Tonight he joins us for one of his first public lectures since leaving the civil service to discuss global governance in the COVID era. He'll set out the global challenges, events and opportunities we may face in 2021. We could not be in better hands this evening to discuss these issues. And so may I now welcome you, Mark, to share your thoughts with us. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you, Vice Chancellor, um, Professor Ian. Uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, those kind words of welcome. Delighted to be here, um, if not at the University of Bath and at the Institute, at least uh, with you in spirit. And I hope to be able to be with you in person at some point. Uh, in the future when, uh, as the Queen put it, we'll all um, meet again. Um, I thought I'd start with the news. Uh, next week, as you all know, um, Joe Biden becomes the 46th President uh, of the United States. Uh, he's had a rumbustrious uh, transition um, and we are uh, through to the end of that yet. But next week he will um, uh, swear uh, the oath uh, uh, on to defend the Constitution of the United States and become its 46th president. An immensely experienced politician, vice president to President Obama and a senator for many years before that. Like all new presidents, his immediate priorities will be domestic. Uh, he will obviously have to seek to restore harmony and dignity to American politics, particularly after the events of the past few days. Uh, he will have to tackle the COVID health and economic crises, which have hit the United States particularly hard. And of course, he'll want to build his own legacy of social and environmental progress. It's striking uh, the degree to which in his platform um, for the presidency, uh, the climate change agenda and the wider environmental agenda were central. And he's chosen in John Kerry, a very experienced former Secretary of State, very experienced uh, statesman, uh, to lead that effort as we head into COP26, the big climate change summit that will be held in the UK later this year. But daunting as the scale of that domestic agenda would be for any president coming uh, to office, he won't have the luxury, as actually President Obama once described it, of, uh, for his own program, uh, of nation building at home, because the rest of the world badly needs American leadership to be restored as well. He's picked a highly experienced foreign policy team. I actually know many of them and have known many of them for the last 20 years. Bill Burns, who's his new CIA director, is an old friend, as is Tony Blinken, the new Secretary of State. That team have essentially emphasized re-engagement and in particular re-engagement with America's allies. They promised to revive arms control negotiations with Iran uh, and Russia to recommit the United States to the World Health Organization and the World Trade Organization. They want to convene a summit of democracies to try and rebuild uh, some relationships that are frayed in the past few years uh, across uh, not only the traditional Western lines, but beyond to other democracies as well, India, Indonesia, Brazil, and so on. And plus, 
probably most important um, uh, is to rejoin the Paris Climate Change uh, Treaty, um, which is critically important in its own right. We can't make progress on that agenda without the United States, but it's also important to the success of COP26, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Climate Change Conference, which is going to be hosted by the UK in Glasgow later this year. America's allies are naturally relieved to be dealing with Biden one rather than Trump two. But it would be a mistake if we regarded the past four years as an alternate reality to be dismissed or forgotten and just retreat into complacency because of the shift in tone about American expectations of their allies uh, or indeed the strategic imperatives of affecting American interests. Much of that predated the Trump administration and much of it won't change. The Biden team will undoubtedly uh, seek to entrench the Abraham Accords. That's the Trump administration's signature achievement in reconciling Israel with their Arab neighbors, particularly to tackle their common adversary, Iran, which remains a major uh, threat to the stability of, uh, of that region. Um, uh, I would expect um, them to try to avoid uh, re-entanglements in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya or, Sy or Syria. Um, as vice president, um, uh, President-elect Biden was skeptical uh, about the way those operations were conducted. There's a bipartisan consensus in Washington on the sharpening US rivalry with China. While the new national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, has spoken of standing with allies against Chinese behavior, he's also criticized the EU's new investment agreement with China, which they rushed through despite the Biden team asking them uh, to postpone it. And he's made clear that the United States will expect allies to stand with the US too. And as Deputy Secretary in the Obama administration, the new Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, um, he was vocal in criticizing European allies during that period, uh, and including the UK at the time, because we at the time also uh, fell short, for failing to meet the NATO commitment to invest 2% of our national income in defense. The UK has more than redressed that. Uh, and the NATO Secretary General, Jan Stoltenberg, has skillfully nudged others uh, to increase theirs, using some of the pressure from President Trump as part of his argument. But it's the case that the EU, for example, and of course the EU and NATO are not the same, but there's a big overlap in their memberships. Uh, the EU still spends only 1.2% of GDP on defence, and of course that's uh, distributed across 27 countries, which is half per head what the UK spends and a third of what the United States spends. And that's in the context of continuous aggression from Russia, uh, obviously the most stark example of which was the Salisbury attack, but, it, but their covert uh, action against Western uh, democratic systems uh, continues through cyber attacks, disinformation and so on. There's still continuing instability to Europe's south and east, and that spills into um, our uh, own continent and this country uh, in the form uh, potentially of terrorist attacks and uh, refugee flows um, and uh, uh, serious and organized crime. And of course, uh, accumulating Chinese influence uh, worldwide, which has accelerated over the past few years. One of the big risks for Western Europe in the next decade is that US preoccupied with China and the Pacific takes talk of strategic autonomy at, at face value and turns uh, their priorities westward um, to the Pacific. Uh, President Trump's first Defense Secretary, General Jim Mattis, a US Marine Corps General, again, a man I serve with and know well, observed that Americans cannot care more than Europeans about European security. So with Brexit accomplished and the opportunity to reboot our own relationships, as the continent's primary, biggest security and defense contributor, um, in my view, the UK should encourage more investment um, in better integrated uh, security and defence capabilities um, by our European partners within the EU, within the EU. Those should be better integrated because capabilities, of course, uh, require that. And that would strengthen the European commitment to NATO and thus protect and promote uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, security. While the challenges in our own neighbourhood are acute, and evolving, uh, as I described. Stabilizing the Western relationship with China, however, is the cornerstone to global security, to um, the future of the world economy, and indeed the future of the environment, because without the US and China in particular engaged, um, we really cannot tackle 
any of these big environmental questions, notably climate change, but also uh, biodiversity, which is less well known, but in many ways equally important. All of that is in the context of huge change in the world. Obviously, we've seen the shock of COVID, which has uh, disrupted the entire global system. But at the same time, as you will all be aware, we have the fourth industrial revolution, the technological revolution, a combination of new technologies that is coming together over the next few years, uh, big data, um, uh, autonomous tech, uh, th synthetic biology, uh, etc., cetera, um, AI, machine learning, and so on, that are probably going to have greater social and economic impacts than any of the previous industrial revolutions since the first on uh, patterns of work, patterns of urbanization, and so on. And the COVID crisis um, hasn't probably altered uh, that course, but it in some cases would have accelerated it. Uh, there's also um, huge demographic, demographic change around the world. By the middle part of the 21st century, the only part of the world uh, which will not have an aging population is Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, it's in the intersection of some of these trends um, that uh, we will see uh, perhaps the most uh, challenging uh, outcomes. So with climate change um, uh, uh, and um, uh, 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 the absence in many cases of decent job opportunities and an economic future uh, for people in sub-Saharan Africa, that can have very major impacts on migration flows, um, uh, thus removing some of the most talented people from the countries that need them uh, and encouraging them to move to North Africa, Western Europe, and so on, with social and economic consequences um, there too. And climate change is, of course, the biggest um, of the uh, challenges that, uh, that we face. Um, we've seen already temperatures have risen by about one degree uh, since the pre-industrial age, and they're set to rise um, if, uh, even if um, all of the commitments made in Paris are realized by uh, an, at least another degree, and more, most likely by two more, so uh, three degrees plus by the end uh, of this century. Of that one degree we've seen so far, the first half degree had little impact on the planetary environment. The second half has seen a significant increase in the volatility um, of uh, the weather. The planetary environment is a delicate system. You don't have to be a wholehearted believer in the, hy the Gaia hypothesis, or I think there's, there are many insights in that myself. Um, to recognize the planet, the planet is a highly complex um, uh, system that uh, is uh, subject to non-linear um, non disruption. Uh, and so uh, with the second half of that first degree already having seen a much greater increase in the volatility of the weather, we have to expect that uh, there will be further um, changes that are difficult to predict in the decades ahead through to the middle part of this century as further rises in the climate are bound to happen. They're already baked in. And so as we deal with climate change, we mustn't only um, uh, uh, drive for net zero, um, uh, uh, vital though that is, we will also have to invest probably almost as much in climate adaptation in making ourselves more resilient uh, to some of those challenges. And many of the most vulnerable nations in the world including some of the small island states in the Commonwealth, which therefore uh, the UK has a particular relationship with, um, are particularly vulnerable to those volatile weather uh, effects. But behind all of that, um, the defining foreign policy challenge uh, and the, as I say, the relationship that will define the course of those events, the environmental events, but political events as well over the next 25 years is going to be the relationship between the US uh, and China, and it will certainly be the defining foreign policy challenge for the Biden administration. To be honest, for the past few years, Western countries have swung uh, between confronting China and seeking to decouple uh, our economies versus conciliating China and trying to deepen economic inter inter interdependence, or in some cases, seeking to straddle uh, the two. And that isn't only a dilemma for us, um, others uh, nearby China like India and the ASEAN nations face much the same uh, challenge. The arguments for the more hardline approach have certainly strengthened. We've seen those arguments becoming more prominent in most uh, Western countries. As the uber confident President Xi Jinping, the, who's been president of China now for uh, several years, has launched the Belt and Road Initiative to extend Chinese influence uh, worldwide, where it's proving very expensive for them. He's asserted what they call China's core interests 
uh, in their own neighborhood, um, uh, uh, bullying many of their neighbors, crackdown at home, uh, as we've seen with the Uyghurs and of course in Hong Kong, and sought to benefit um, from the COVID crisis, given that the Chinese economy uh, is one of the few that has actually had positive growth in 2020, notwithstanding the, um, the earlier uh, shock that it took. And as the 21st century's workshop of the world, a phrase that was used at the UK in the 19th century during the first industrial revolution, the Chinese economy um, is and will remain um, the engine of global economic growth. Uh, with Chinese uh, companies investing more in R&D, but also in many cases uh, more in industrial espionage as well than, uh, than any competitor. So we must be realistic about the scale of the challenge, but we mustn't underestimate the strength of um, the Western position or indeed of the Western model. Together still, the US, the EU and the five big independent uh, advanced economies, so Japan, the UK, Canada, uh, South Korea and Australia still account for about two thirds of the global economy. Notwithstanding the knock to our own confidence and our public confidence in the model from the 2008 financial crisis and, and, and the 2020 COVID crisis, ultimately democratic market systems, uh, societies that are pluralistic and respect the individual, whether Western or Eastern, advanced or developing, will in my view, they have the ability to self-correct and thus to out-innovate any authoritarian state uh, system that is bound to prize control of its own pub public um, over their prosperity uh, and rights. And so our, our model, that model, those underlying principles, as we see after COVID to build back better and greener and high tech and more resilient, uh, will remain the foundation not only of our national prosperity, but of um, our global influence. On that foundation, in my view, it is important that um, we build a consistent, coherent and comprehensive uh, consensus to establish a new kind of relationship, a more stable relationship uh, with China that needs to be cognizant of the imperatives of our political system, which is not gonna change anytime soon. We will have to contest their behavior when it disrupts international peace and security and breaches obligations that they have made. We must cooperate though on the big global environmental and health issues and then uh, meanwhile, competing freely and fairly within properly enforced rules of the world economic uh, system. I believe it is possible to achieve that new equilibrium uh, with China um, if, um, uh, uh, if we are thoughtful, intelligent and engage China effectively on it. One might call it detente with Chinese characteristics. The key, though, is consensus. Um, uh, let's be honest, there's been a period of fractious relationships among um, allies, um, but the advent of the Biden administration, the conclusion of the Brexit process, the opportunity there is there for a, uh, an opportunity to re reset, reboot and reassemble uh, the Western alliance, which proved so strong in the 20th century, reconnect with the wider democratic community, countries like India, the ASEAN nations uh, and others that essentially share our values uh, um, uh, uh, based on their own historical traditions so that those values and our interests can prevail in the 21st century, uh, just as they did in the 20th. The UK does have a, an opportunity to shape that. We have the G7 presidency this year, we're leading COP26. Uh, we've just celebrated the UN 75th anniversary here in the UK as well. So there's a natural leadership moment for the UK. Now we're through the Brexit process and there's been an amicable, um, if hard for settlement um, with our EU, uh, friends and neighbours, uh, I believe we have a responsibility to use those, um, that, those, that opportunity that we have to try and seize that moment and shape that consensus and try and find a new way of underpinning the overall global governance. What does that really amount to? Well, uh, we need to reinforce the multilateral institutions, notably the UN, but the others like the WHO, the WTO, uh, and so on, uh, to ensure that the rules of the international system are understood everywhere, everyone respects them and they're properly enforced uh, and applied. And that requ requires uh, countries to uh, engage with them, but it also requires us to expect uh, and respect uh, the, views of, uh, the views of others. Countries like China, but like India, like Brazil, South Africa and so on, must have a role in shaping 
um, the uh, nature of those institutions and indeed of the rules uh, within the rules-based order, but then those rules must be uh, observed. There will be actions we need to take with other like-minded countries. Some of that could be aligning some of our, in, uh, of our industrial policy and investments, um, working out how we might cooperate more effectively on tech and on the green agenda and greening uh, our economies and so on. And then there will be actions we should take within our own economies, particularly as we recover from COVID and seek to uh, reshape, reshape our economies, as I say, to build back better and greener, high tech and, uh, uh, and more, uh, more, more resilient. And so there are huge challenges ahead, but I'm absolutely confident that we can rise to those uh, challenges. Um, and it's your generation, because many of these issues will be uh, important uh, uh, when you uh, are in positions of, uh, uh, of influence, once you've left university and are engaging in the world, whether that's in business or government or the third sector or education or wherever it might be, um, much of that will be uh, the responsibility of your generation just as much as it is of mine that must obviously lead us through these next uh, few years. So I think there's a real opportunity for it. I think there's a real opportunity for this country. Um, and that, in my view, is what global Britain uh, should be about. Uh, underpinning the rules of the multilateral system and reinforcing it, re-engaging it, um, and encouraging others to do the same. Uh, using our network of influence through the Commonwealth, our soft power, the BBC, the British Council, the, the attractiveness of our tertiary education system to many around the world who learn so much about our country uh, and the values that we uh, believe in from uh, coming here uh, to, be, uh, to be educated and in building big relationships, really strong relationships with like-minded countries, uh, whether Western or Eastern advanced or developing, and use that to shape um, that global governance that was the title of this talk. Vice-Chancellor, I hope that is a, a reasonable introduction, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Sedwell. Um, and for those watching, I'm Nick Pierce. I'm a professor of public policy at the University of Bath, and I direct the Institute for Policy Research. And I'm going to just uh, chair a, a Q&A session for you with Lord Sedwell. Uh, we've already got some questions uh, coming in, and I think there's some very clear themes from, uh, from Mark's um, analysis. Um, the changes that we might expect with a Biden uh, administration of re-engagement with multilateral institutions, but some continuities with the Trump years and those that preceded them, uh, skepticism of entanglement, Lord Sedwell talked about in places like uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, countries that he knows very well and which have come up, I think, in our, in our questions. Um, some uh, huge issues, of course, in respect of China, uh, a huge priority, again, as Lord Sedwell said, for the Biden administration, but where there is more consensus in the US than perhaps people observing the country from the outside and from Europe might expect uh, about China. Um, uh, despite the kind of language of President Trump and so on, there's you know, a, a lot of other positions that are shared across the aisle in these issues in the States. And here I think it's very interesting uh, reference to sort of detente with Chinese characteristics, this question of how you um, work with China um, in, a, in a world in which its economic influence just gets greater and greater, uh, but it, with, a, with a government which um, under its current leadership perhaps has particular characteristics that need to be uh, addressed under Xi Jinping. Um, and then I think there were some very um, important questions about obviously what multilateral institutions have to do to enable us to meet the challenge of climate change uh, coming out of the COVID pandemic um, and whether those multilateral institutions with renewed American commitment, if that indeed does happen, can be reshaped to take on board the interests of those other rising powers, important economic and political uh, powers such as um, China, Brazil, India, and, and so on. So there's a number of questions here for Britain, how it finds its place in this world, uh, but also the sorts of objectives it might set for its um, uh, uh, diplomatic, military, economic, and other uh, uh, institutions, and how they relate to those, obviously, uh, of, the, of the rest of the world now we're outside the European Union. And I should just register, I think, another important point that Lord Sedwell made there was that, um, you know, seeking to see greater integration of capabilities in the European Union on defence and security, uh, and what that might mean for NATO and uh, the UK's relationship to uh, Europe within NATO. So a, a lot we can discuss there. The first 
uh, question. I think it would be good actually if we were able to uh, talk, Lord said, well, a, a little bit about the question of Iraq and Af Afghanistan, because I, I, as Professor White said in his introduction, you know, these are countries that you, you know well, you are am ambassador uh, to Afghanistan, um, you know, a lot of involvement in both Iraq and Afghanistan. You've got a private secretary, I believe, also to uh, Robin Cook and Jack Straw at the Foreign Office, um, uh, when Iraq issues were obviously, of course, you know, uh, very big ones. Um, so I just wonder what you might say about that. You know, what are the prospects for peace in Afghanistan in the year ahead? And what are the prospects for, um, uh, you know, a wider settlement uh, in the Middle East that might relate to Iraq and Afghanistan, given the turbulence they've experienced in recent years? Well, thanks, Nick. Uh, really important questions both. Um, let me take Afghanistan to start with. Actually, I was on a, 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 a quite long Zoom call to uh, colleagues in the United States uh, this afternoon, the Atlantic Council, which is a, a well-known uh, think tank. I don't think they like the word, but it's a well-known think tank. is actually convening uh, quite a lot of uh, former diplomats, politicians, etc., with experience of Afghanistan, including Afghans, to think through exactly that question that you've just uh, you've just put, so it feels uh, quite current um, to me. Um, I think, I mean, I, there's a very long answer to that question, but I think the short answer is it is in the balance. Um, uh, the negotiations with the Taliban are proceeding and they're about to go into another round of those in Doha in, in Qatar, but it's wrong to see Afghanistan and to see the divisions within Afghanistan through the sort of Western lens, if you like. We're used to thinking of our own politics uh, in terms of uh, essentially ideological divisions, and we tend to impose that um, paradigm when we're looking at others. So we think in Afghanistan, to put it very simply, of government and legitimate opposition, and then the insurgency led by the Taliban, and think and think in quite ideological terms about that. Much of it, of course, is about the ethnic and tribal politics uh, of Afghanistan, which is a highly complex um, uh, society, uh, and about whether different groups feel included or excluded from the levers of power and the opportunity to control their own destiny. And often it's the exclusion from those um, uh, levers of influence that causes um, groups to affiliate with the Taliban, even if they don't particularly share their ideological agenda. And so much of what needs to happen in Afghanistan will have to happen at the grassroots level, particularly in those, uh, in those rural areas. Um, and that's really um, less about whether there can be a political agreement between the Afghan government and the Taliban, supported by the international community, and more about whether any agreement can, um, can actually endure and put down roots and, and there can be a stable future for Afghanistan. I think the key point for the West is to remain committed. One of the mistakes we've constantly made, and it's for understandable reasons, people tire of these campaigns, uh, we lost an awful lot of over 400 British soldiers um, uh, in Afghanistan, British military personnel in Afghanistan, uh, including you know, probably a third of that number in the time that I was there uh, a decade uh, a decade ago, um, at the at the peak of the uh, of the military campaign, and so people do tire of these things. But if we um, suggest that we are going to withdraw without the conditions, the right conditions in place, all we're doing is encouraging the insurgency and encouraging the Taliban to think that in the end, if they're just patient enough, they can wait us out and uh, they will be able to take over. And so making sure that the withdrawal of military forces is conditions-based, not just to an artificial timeline, and committing to remain in support of the Afghan uh, government for the long term with development aid, with support as they build the rule of law, and support for their armed forces to maintain the security of the, uh, of the country and diplomatic engagement to stop their neighbors meddling and so on, is critical to set the conditions for the right kind of political settlement. And of course, for that political settlement to endure. As I said, I think all of that is in the balance um, right now. On Iraq, I mean, Iraq is rather different. I mean, Iraq, some of the same lessons apply but Iraq, uh, of course, is in a different uh, situation. It's a country with uh, considerable uh, oil wealth. It had more advanced political institutions. Um, and Iraq's problem is, is, is uh, there are some uh, parallels with Afghanistan. Iraq's problem is, as much as anything, uh, external meddling. And in particular, the influence of Iran, which sees Iraq as an important 
uh, piece in creating a crescent of influence um, from the Mediterranean um, through um, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran itself, and indeed through Afghanistan, uh, right up to the, um, uh, the, the, the Hindu Kush. And that crescent of influence is based largely on Iran asserting itself as, a, as the leader of the Shia uh, community uh, in the Middle East. Um, many of those uh, Shia, in fact, most are not uh, um, of Iranian ethnic origin, they're Arab Shia, and many of them um, uh, do not uh, naturally see them, their main affiliation as being religious as opposed to national uh, or whatever. But that is certainly what Iran has sought to do um, with proxies, most famously uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, but running through all of those countries. And stabilizing Iraq in particular will require us to um, uh, reduce the uh, influence of Iran, the Shia militia groups in particular that are really disruptive to the political process uh, there, and to give the Iraqis themselves the opportunity to, to again create that kind of balanced political settlement I was describing for Afghanistan that reconciles Sunni, Shia, Kurdish um, uh, interests um, and is genuinely, uh, genuinely inclusive. And that means um, uh, uh, trying to reduce the disruptive effect of external influences with Iran probably primary among those, but not the only one, as you will know, Nick. Mm. Could we just, uh, just on, the, on the question of Iran, because obviously that, that was a big sort of point of disagreement between the Trump administration and its predecessor, and of course with um, uh, those powers in Europe, U U UK, Russia, and others who negotiated the nuclear agreement with Iran. I mean, what, what do you see the Biden administration doing there? Because, um, and, and it relates to another question we have also that's coming, which is just, you know, there are some outgoing areas where Mike Pompeo is, you know, seeking to um, leave behind some legacy, Cuba, Taiwan, uh, Yemen, etc. cetera. Um, and I just, you know, there are obviously going to be areas where, you know, the team that you talked about are going to have to recalibrate quite quickly. Um, so just, just, I just wanted you to address that point perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, I think we'll, see, we'll see continuity in some areas and change in others. So I wouldn't expect there to be a major difference, uh, at least in the early period, between the Biden administration's approach to Taiwan, for example, than, um, as you say, the outgoing administrations uh, has been, because there's a strong, as you, uh, as you referred to, Nick, a strong bipartisan consensus in Washington on the need to uh, have a more robust approach to China and in particular to China's pressure on uh, countries in its region. And Taiwan is of course a long-standing concern of the United States, uh, but South Korea, Japan, et cetera, uh, find themselves in, in you know, different but similar um, uh, circumstances. So I would think, I wouldn't expect to see a major change there. Um, I think on Iran, I mean, the big difference of course is that the Trump administration withdrew from the JCPOA and tried to get others to do the same, resorted to a, a, a campaign of maximum pressure. And uh, uh, the Biden uh, team have said they will re-engage with the JCPOA. I don't think that is just as simple though, as simply turning the clock back and, and rejoining. Um, various of the deadlines in the JCPOA, this is the joint uh, agreement to stop um, uh, uh, Iran acquiring nuclear weapons technology in return for sanctions relief. That's fundamentally what it was about, secured in 2015. Um, that, uh, that, that various uh, elements of that agreement were expiring anyway over the next couple of years. And so it would need to have been renewed, even if the United States had remained committed to it, and even if Iran had remained in complete compliance with it, which of course it didn't. So that's why when I referred in my opening remarks, I talked about arms control agreements with Iran, as opposed to necessarily the JCPOA. And the Biden team have said, they will, the United States will re-enter the JCPOA, but only if Iran comes back into full compliance with it. Well, there's quite a lot of negotiating to be done to achieve uh, that goal. As I said, the JCPOA itself will need to be updated, extended, refreshed, uh, and so on. And the JCPOA just dealt with the Iranian nuclear program. There are other uh, weapon systems the Iranians uh, have developed, which are uh, also potentially destabilizing, for example, long range ballistic missiles. Uh, which could as well as carry nuclear warheads could carry chemical weapons or other um, warheads and again my view is that those um, are best dealt with through an arms control process because the, the alternative in the end is sanctions or indeed or indeed military action but those will have to be part of um, a refreshed uh, negotiation with Iran 
um, in order to reduce the threat they present to their region. Otherwise, we'll just see the arms race in that region um, um, uh, uh, continuing. Some other Iranian behavior, in particular, their sponsorship of these violent militias, export of terrorism, uh, et cetera, uh, is probably not, so, is not really susceptible to diplomatic agreements because they're very difficult to police. And so that will require um, a range of different um, uh, techniques, including um, pressure, but also uh, use of intelligence and military assets in order to, to uh, remove, the, the, remove those threats. Thank you, uh, Lord Sobel. I, I want to, uh, we've got a couple of questions on India. So I just want to, uh, we'll do some countries if we may, and then we'll go to some of the wider questions. Um, of course. But on yeah. India, I mean, there has been now for at least 20 years, a sort of a view that comes in and out of British foreign policy that uh, our history and our uh, other affiliations with India make it a natural strategic ally and economic partner. And those, those aspirations, you know, whether you think that's post-imperial uh, nostalgia or whatever it might be, they, 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 they always appear to be dashed. The Indians never quite seem to want to, uh, to be the partner we would wish them to be. Um, and one of our questions is addressed actually to the nature of its current um, uh, government, uh, Modi and the BJP government, which, um, you know, shares, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so some features with other authoritarian regimes and it's quite, you know, it's a Hindu nationalist government. Um, I, I wonder whether you know, that means that India is not quite the kind of um, natural democratic ally that perhaps we might sometimes imagine it to be, or indeed going to respond readily to overtures from the UK of the kind that we've given them in the past. Yeah, I think it's, it's a, again, it's a really uh, interesting area. I mean, the simple truth is that our complicated history with India has always been a constraint um, actually from the Indian side on their willingness to really engage in a deep strategic partnership with the UK. Um, many governments from our side have sought to develop that. And you're right, there's always been some reluctance on the other side. And some of that is because of our complex, uh, our complex history, but also a perception um, that, um, you know, in a sense, rightly, I served there, we try to avoid choosing sides in the continuing tensions between India and Pakistan, partly in order to be able to play a, a, a role in seeking to ease those tensions and maintain a decent enough relationship with, uh, with Pakistan to, um, to be able to do so. And of course, we have big interests in Pakistan as well, a um, uh, big um, uh, uh, community of Pakistani origin here in the UK, same sort of size almost as the, as the Indian community, so the kind of scale at least. And of course, it's absolutely crucial to Afghanistan and, and, and other interests. So in a sense, a complete alignment has always been um, uh, frustratingly difficult to achieve because not, not all of our interests are completely aligned or at least as perceived by um, uh, the, the, the two capitals. But that said, we have to, if we take a step back, we do have some very big interests in common and not least we have the forum of the Commonwealth and, and you know, an awful lot of shared um, uh, history there, but um, India is up close and personal with China. There was a ghastly incident uh, in the Himalayas uh, only a few months ago where Indian soldiers were brutally uh, killed by Chinese soldiers up on the line of actual control, which is a disputed border between India um, and China uh, up in a very, very um, uh, cold, um, um, uh, high altitude uh, regions. Uh, and China and India see each other as strategic rivals. Mm. Um, and so um, as we seek to work out what is the uh, democratic world's posture to China and how are we going to have a coherent posture to China that doesn't slide towards the whole Thucydides trap, trap question of, of um, uh, you know, conflict and confrontation and stabilizes that relationship, India is absolutely crucial uh, part of it. It's an important market for the UK. Um, and there are some parts of India where actually our uh, economic relationship is really close. That tends to be at the state level rather than at the, uh, at the federal level, um, at the republic uh, uh, level, but, it's, uh, but there are some areas, some parts of India where the relationship is really close. So I think it's always going to be complex. There are always going to be areas where our interests are not aligned. Um, overall, however, our interests are broadly more aligned than not, and therefore I think uh, as long as we're consistent about it and realistic about it and recognize there are going to be constraints uh, and limits to it, 
um, then we should continue to try and invest in our relationship with India and recognize that our overall interest is two democracies um, uh, with um, uh, um, um, economic and, uh, uh, and, and other connections, people to people connections, um, override the, the, the differences. But, but recognizing that we aren't, you know, we can't put those complications aside completely. Um, you've, you've mentioned uh, the Commonwealth on, on a few occasions, and um, uh, there has been, uh, again, in the last sort of couple of decades, um, although it's a much more long standing way of thinking in British um, policy. A, a focus on the so-called Anglosphere uh, of the countries like Canada and Australia, New Zealand, um, which are embodied, of course, in the Five Eyes um, intelligence cooperation structure. Um, but a view, and it's particularly been held, I think, by those who um, were advocating for Brexit um, uh, uh, at Eurosceptics, that that, that that Anglosphere is Britain's sort of natural place in the world. These are former um, uh, colonies, they are, uh, for the large part, they are English speaking, they are liberal democracies, market economies, etc. That's, that's the argument that's made. Um, and, um, uh, and people advocating that kind of much stronger collaboration with those countries would be a valuable thing. And it's quite, it's noticeable in recent uh, weeks and months, perhaps with the exception of New Zealand, uh, that those countries have uh, issued joint communiques on the uh, question of Hong Kong in particular, the Uyghurs, um, and that there has been some, you know, something of a kind of whether it's whether it's been mobilised by the Americans or not. I mean, you would know, I I, I wouldn't, but um, there has been something of a of a sort of mobilisation, particularly on these Chinese questions. Um, now, is that indicative of something that actually does have? Some, some substance to it? Is there something called uh, the Anglosphere, Kanzuk, Five Eyes, which is meaningful in these terms in, in the future of diplomacy and military and other security links? Or is this, is this something which is just an artifact of a particular moment in history and the UK seeking uh, particularly at the current time to, to, to be reaching out to, to older allies? So I don't think it's an artifact. I mean, there is, you know, there is the, the, the... The Anglosphere, as you uh, as you rightly describe it, of course, has much broader and deeper um, components to it than just the Five Eyes intelligence and defence relationship. But that's, of course, critically important to it. And so, when um, the the new aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth goes to the Pacific next year, uh, there will be Australian and New Zealand and other ships as you know, operating as part of that carrier strike group, completely actually not only interoperable, but integrated with, um, with the Royal Navy. And so you know, our traditions of training together, of people from Australia coming to Sandhurst, people from the UK going, going there, et cetera, um, mean that the, the, defense and the defense security intelligence relationship is really, really deep. And there's, of course, there's a lot more to it than that as well, you know, the cultural alignment um, and so on. Actually, one of the things that has been constrained um, uh, and that's just because of the, the nature of trade, and in particular during our 40 years as a member of the EU, was the economic relationships have not been as strong as um, the political, defence, security and cultural relationships. And now that the UK is independent, um, then it's obviously natural that we would want to deepen the economic relationships um, as well. That shouldn't, in my view, be exclusive. Um, I don't think we should think of the Anglosphere or indeed the Commonwealth, which is a very different kind of institution, as alternatives to a really strong set of uh, partnerships here in Europe um, with our continental neighbours, which is where most of our trade and most of our um, security uh, issues arise, or indeed with the United States, or indeed with um, uh, other traditional and new partners uh, worldwide. One of the things that the, the UK's economy is actually the most globalised in the G20, it's the most open and globalised connected in the G20. I think that's one of our national strengths. And so uh, now that we're through Brexit and we've negotiated a new trade agreement, uh, trade and cooperation agreement with the, um, with the EU, um, for us to prosper in the future, we, ha we have to avoid these relationships being either or. It has to be a great relationship with the EU, a great relationship with the US, a great relationship, great relationships elsewhere um, uh, as well. So acceding, for example, to the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, the CPTPP, would be a major step forward for the UK in building our economic relationships in 
that part of the world. And those things are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and that has to be, in my view, the way we make a success of, if you like, Brexit Britain, global Britain, um, as we leave. It's, it's in uh, trying to have um, uh, these strong relationships with natural partners worldwide. So um, we've got a couple of questions which then take that into how, how those objectives cash out in specific um, objectives for the G7 and, and for Glasgow, for the COP. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, I think it would be interesting to our audience to sort of hear a little bit from you about how governments develop agendas for these big moments that they have. You know, when you're in the chair of the G7, it's a big deal. You know, the, the whole of government in, is mobilised towards thinking about it. Uh, and ditto, of course, with uh, the COP negotiations in Glasgow. Perhaps you might say a little bit about, um, you know, how the government will prepare for those uh, big moments this year and what they might seek to achieve from them. Sure, um, they are different and, and just the process and thus the government's role in them is different. So uh, uh, COP is actually a UN conference. It isn't a British conference. It's just hosted by the UK and actually with Italy as our co-host and Italy are the presidency of the G20 this year. So you have the G7 president, the G20 president co-hosting COP in, uh, in Glasgow. But the actual negotiations, the, 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 the detail of that is run by the United Nations. Now, of course, uh, if we're hosting it, we are highly invested in its success. And that's why Alok Sharma has now uh, become full time president of COP and stepped aside from his job as um, uh, Secretary of State for Business. Um, and he will be heavily engaged, along with John Kerry, the new uh, US uh, environmental envoy, in trying to uh, drive the agenda forward. This is five years on from Paris. It's therefore the first really major punctuation point in the process since Paris. And it will have, I think, two big objectives. One is to try and ensure more countries sign up to um, not only the Paris um, uh, targets, but actually uh, real uh, programs of, uh, uh, of reform and deliveries in order to be able to, to achieve those Paris targets. And that, of course, as we know, is going to require major investment in economic and social uh, change. And also then to extend the level of ambition, because as we know, um, uh, par uh, even if um, uh, Paris were achieved, as I said in my opening remarks, um, the world, the climate will still rise with unpredictable, um, uh, unpredictable effects. It could, for example, disrupt the Gulf Stream current that is responsible for the temperate climate of the UK. And paradoxically, uh, one of the one of the outcomes of climate change could be the UK has a colder climate if that if that ocean current is um, uh, uh, is disrupted by it. So it is quite unpredictable. Uh, all of this. Um, uh, and so that's a critically important moment. And I think you'll see um, uh, the, the British government putting all of its weight behind it. And, and, uh, uh, but as I say, it's slightly different because we're not actually in the chair. So it's more of a behind the scenes role, um, advocating, arm twisting, trying to ensure that countries come to the, uh, to the Glasgow summit um, in the right frame of mind to achieve um, achieve the goals whilst respecting the UN's negotiation of the uh, of the, uh, 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 the, the the process uh, the process itself, and a lot of that will be through bilateral diplomacy, persuading India and Brazil and China and Indonesia and others um, to make the kind of commitments that we think are necessary, uh, but of course reassuring them that others are going to do the same and they aren't going to disadvantage themselves in a world that is still recovering from. Uh, the, the COVID economic as well as the COVID health uh, crisis. G7 is rather different, much smaller group of countries, of course, only, well, seven, uh, typically with these things, it isn't quite seven because it's seven plus the EU. So um, actually in that sense, although it's the EU there institutionally, there's a representation of 27 countries there, and several of whom are members of the G7, of course, um, but it's a much uh, because it's a much smaller uh, organization, it's informal, it doesn't have a permanent secretariat and so on. The role of the presidency is therefore much more central in shaping the agenda. Now, presidencies inherit agreements from previous uh, presidents. The G7, for example, has had a tradition of um, uh, invo encouraging more development uh, involvement in Africa, for example. That's often been a, a big, uh, a big uh, topic for the G7. Uh, and therefore the choice, but the choice of the issues on which a G7 presidency is going to focus is very much down to the head of government of the, of the presidency of the day. And that, um, of course, in our case is 
the Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson. He wants to focus on environmental issues, uh, obviously COVID recovery, uh, global economic resilience, and some other um, uh, uh, and, and then some other topics that he has uh, inherited. And that's something that is uh, it requires much more personal engagement. Um, the structure of it requires a lot of personal engagement by the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, uh, 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 as they uh, as they head to the summit, which will take place in June in, in Cornwall, I think. It, it, it does seem, I've got a question on this too, it does seem, uh, even if you take a purely instrumental perspective on these questions, an odd time to have integrated our Department for International Development with our Foreign Office and to have announced a cut in aid spending, uh, albeit that you know, there's still significant spending on, on aid. It, you know, in terms of, you know, if you're seeking international influence, credibility uh, in a world in which, you know, you've come out of the European Union and you're dealing with a new Biden administration and you've got these big responsibilities. Uh, I mean, this is this is peculiar timing to put it to put it mildly. But does it does it indicate um, a, a sort, sort of wider strain of thinking in the government that the sort of what had been a consensus on uh, 0.7 of GDP and, and different spending across the parties for the best part of the last sort of 10 years or so is, has frayed? Well, I hope not. Um, and I think the government's been quite careful to say that they regard it as a temporary cut because mm. of the COVID economic crisis. And I regret the fact it happened. You know, I was national security advisor, and I think one of the, um, the, the, the probably the key um, 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 distinction for the UK in the world was our ability to bring together both world class but also really significant levels of investment and capability in defence and development and diplomacy and intelligence um, and other things. And so I welcomed the increase in defence expenditure um, uh, uh, up to now well over 2%, 2.4, almost 2.5% of GDP. I regret the cut in aid expenditure. I would always want to see us maintaining that almost unique balance in um, our hard and soft power that I think means that we can play uh, a role, um, a, a really significant role on the world stage, combining with our diplomatic clout through the Security Council and so on. And when I was National Security Advisor, I used to brag that we were the only country that met the 2% target for defense and the 0.7% target for development. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's you know, important that it's, uh, that it's restored um, uh, you know, as soon as the government is able to do so. Now, that said, 0.5 is still more than most other countries do. It's still one of the largest aid budgets uh, in the world. Uh, DFID um, and the, the UK have always been highly influential um, in shaping the development agenda and have played a leadership role in that. And I see no reason why that shouldn't continue. I don't think we should see the merger of DFID and the Foreign Office as um, a retrograde step at all, actually. Um, uh, I, uh, my own view that they were they were all they've been coming more closely together for many years um, and that's been a good thing uh, you don't want to be running separate development policies and foreign policies you want these things to come together if you want to have an impact um, and if we can uh, use the leverage of the two departments which by the way is the model that nearly every other western country has um, of, of integration of their foreign uh, of their diplomatic and development efforts in uh, in single departments very few countries ever split it as, uh, as we did. Uh, and the key there is not the institutional arrangement, it's the agenda um, and the impact that we have. And I, you know, I hope and believe that the FCDO can actually enhance that by bringing these two instruments together in a more coherent way. Great, thank you. Can I, can I just, um, for the final bit of our discussion, sort of turn to COVID and its, um, and its impacts. And uh, one question is just um, on COVID and, and multilateralism. Uh, we have some questions on that issue that you know we've seen obviously every country kind of having to prioritize its own interests um uh, so-called vaccine nationalism um we've had criticisms of the who americans you know pulling out um and and the danger that uh, the experience of covid with travel bans immigration controls of uh, vaccine nationalism these things undermine multilateralism and make it harder to fulfill the agenda you talked about of renewing multilateral governance uh, in, the, in the coming years. Um, that's one question. And then closer to home, um, you know, you were in, you were the cabinet sector in the heart of decision-making um, as the crisis struck. And I wonder, I'm not 
wouldn't want to ask you to say anything about uh, you know how we should view our, the decisions we've taken on COVID, but I but I wonder whether you might say something about what it's revealed about our state and its capabilities and what it does well and what it hasn't done well and where it needs to think afresh about its strengths and weaknesses and the capabilities it has because if if COVID has done anything it's uh, as it's struck every country around the world simultaneously it's exposed where countries have weaknesses as well as revealing where they have strengths so I wonder if you might say something about those two questions that COVID and the pandemic are posing to us yeah, thanks you don't ask small questions do you <laughs> well um, so I I, I, I realize we, we've got a little bit of your time left and, and I, yeah, I, sure, I of course. To... no of course of course um um so just starting uh, where, where we've been so far looking globally, look, I think we have to be completely honest, the international system did not handle COVID well. It did handle the financial crisis in 2008 pretty well, and the UK um, under Gordon Brown at the time uh, played a really significant role in that, and the G20 really came into, it, 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 into maturity during that period and um, uh, managed a, a cooperative approach to... Uh, that uh, that shock to the world economy, and we haven't seen that with COVID. Um, actually, the, uh, as you say, the the international response has been fragmented, rivalrous, uh, uh, and uh, and so on. And um, there's been PPE nationalism as well as um, as well as as you said, vaccine uh, and other nationalism. And so we have to acknowledge that we are not starting from the right place yet. But there are some positive signs. There are. Uh, facilities, COVAX, uh, an international facility that the UK has played a very important role in to try and ensure that vaccines are available to developing countries that couldn't compete with advanced economies if it was simply a matter of who has more money um, uh, in order to ensure that they get the vaccinations as well. The, the Oxford vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, is actually more suitable for deployment into many of these countries because it doesn't require refrigeration at very, very low temperatures and very delicate handling the way that um, some of the other uh, vaccines too. And therefore, I think there's a big opportunity for the vaccine that's been developed in the UK to become the workhorse um, of uh, the global uh, approach to vaccination, particularly in countries which don't have the same kind of sophisticated uh, uh, medical infrastructure that, for example, the UK and most Western, um, Western European countries um, have but we have to take as an international community a decision that we're going to learn the lessons of that and that um, when the when the world faces shocks like a pandemic or like the financial crisis in 2008 we look at 2008 and realize actually we did pretty well at keeping the world aligned on that occasion and why was it different um, this time um, uh, uh, and can we try and ensure that it is better um, uh, in future, because there will be another shock of some kind. It might not be another pandemic, might not be another financial crisis. There will be a shock of some kind, um, probably of the same kind of scale at some point in the next 20 or 30 years, actually, probably most likely relating to climate change, I would have thought, but, but one, never, one never knows. And so um, the answer to recognising that the world didn't respond as well as it should, the architecture didn't uh, respond as well as it should, internationally to COVID is not to ditch that architecture, it's to reinvest in it, rebuild it, identify where it didn't work and then plug the gaps and try and ensure that it is in better shape next time around. I think domestically, um, I mean it's a very big question, of course there will be a, an inquiry at some point that will be addressing exactly that question, so yeah, it's premature of me to, uh, to, to give you more than a personal view. I think we should be really proud of the things we did do well. Um, you know, the public service responded with uh, remarkable creativity and commitment across the public service. I mean, we set up the Nightingale hospitals faster than China built theirs. There's the uh, whole public-private effort that went into the vaccine development. Um, uh, as we went into the first lockdown, we planned our way out of it. The high levels of public compliance with the lockdowns are something, again, we should be, uh, we should be proud of. And I think what we see is that the British, um, uh, the, the economic measures that we took were highly innovative and implemented really effectively and really fast. I think one of the key strengths we see of the British state system, the public service as a whole, which goes well beyond uh, just the civil service, let alone Whitehall, which is about 1% of the public service, is its ability to respond to a crisis once it hits. Um, and that common sense of purpose that we're able to create the ability to work across boundaries, the sense of teamwork and so on is something that is 
um, rare in the world and is a real strength. And we see it in response to other crises, whether something like the you know, Salisbury attack um, or major flooding or whatever uh, it might be. M many other countries envy our ability to bring all these capabilities together and respond. I think on the downside, we have to recognize that there were, uh, that, that, uh, there were certain areas that were simply um, under-investing and under-resourced. So we have per head a much lower ratio of critical care beds in this country than most Western European countries, half than some, I think about a quarter as many um, as Germany. Now, with something that grows exponentially like COVID, you're always going to hit a limit, no matter how high that limit is. But the truth is um, that, uh, that, that uh, we do have less capacity in that area than other than some uh, other uh, uh, some other countries. Um, we have successive governments have invested uh, very large amounts of money in healthcare, but they've largely invested that in dealing with uh, the the uh, priorities of an age, the health priorities of an aging population. Um, quite naturally, so you know, who, who doesn't want uh, to ensure that the marginal amount of money is spent on providing better healthcare um, uh, right now? But that does mean that we haven't set aside. Um, um, uh, money, say for, uh, or as much money as perhaps we should have done for contingency planning. If you look at the fire brigade, it's resourced to deal with catastrophic events, even though most of the time it isn't dealing with those events, and most of the time um, it's using that capability uh, in other ways, but it is, it is designed and resourced to be able to deal with a rare catastrophic event, and the healthcare system isn't, and we're going to have to ask ourselves not about shifting entirely to that model, but about whether um, we have the balance of resources between contingent capability and current capacity, uh, right, or indeed whether we have enough resources in healthcare um, uh, uh, overall, and whether, the, whether it is still right that those resources will come through central taxation, or should we look at models like the German model and others where there's a bigger regional role in the provision of healthcare, um, uh, uh, and different um, uh, um, ways of drawing more funding in from uh, other sources. So I think we have to look at capability um, to see whether, um, whether we can ensure we're in better shape for a, for a similar crisis in future. What we mustn't do is assume the next major health crisis or indeed the next major pandemic will have all of the features of coronavirus, because it might not. If it was Ebola, it would have been Zika, then the measures we'd have taken would have been very different and the, 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 um, the areas the vulnerabilities we would have seen exposed would have been different too. Well, Lord Sebel, you've given us some really comprehensive and detailed answers across a whole range of uh, issues from the global to the national. And um, I know that cut this lecture and, and your answers come at uh, the end of a long day on Zoom meeting. So I feel we've probably now um, asked enough of you of your time. And I, I hope for our audience that um, those that ask questions, we've answered enough of those questions as they came in uh, that uh, that you posed uh, to Lord Sedwell, um, and thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, but Lord Sedwell, I, I want to thank you on behalf of the Institute for Policy Research, the University of Bath, for um, you know fantastic uh, lecture and for giving us um, the benefit of your experience, expertise across, a, as I say, a whole range of issues, countries. Uh, questions, policy, policy challenges. So we're really grateful to you for joining us this evening. Uh, we wish you all the best in your future uh, roles this year uh, as you um, uh, engage with the Biden administration and all the other questions you've just uh, tackled. So um, the very best of luck with all of those. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us. And again, thank you Lord Sedwell for your remarks and for your uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Very thank much. you, great questions. Really enjoyed the session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.